Picture a world of chaos. In fact, you do not have to actually picture that. You can read about it in Scripture. In 1 Kings 17.25 and also at the end of that book, the very last verse, the Bible says there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. A world of chaos. As opposed to a world of authority. Our topic this morning is the critical importance of understanding Bible authority. The critical importance of understanding Bible authority. The old debaters had various sayings, and this particular man or brother, whoever originated it, had this saying. He said, I will not have a discussion with you or a debate with you until you first define your terms. And so we want to define our terms, the critical importance. That means it matters, and it matters a lot. The critical importance of understanding, that means you can know. Bible, authority. Bible means God's Word, and authority, that's the word we're looking at right now. What does that mean? It means that which is lawful. It deals with permission, commandment, power, obey, to exercise authority or dominion over. We're talking about the idea of a pattern, the fact that the Bible is a pattern, and men can understand the Bible and obey the Bible. That's simply all I'm speaking of. The idea of critically understanding Bible authority. Now, to show you how simple this is, I tore out one of the pages in many books that I like to read, and I started just writing down things as they would come to me. Watch an old black and white movie. I like those old black and white movies. And their singing is kind of a musical, believe it or not. And it's singing about a knife, a fork, and a spoon. And I thought, you know, there's a difference in a knife and a fork and a spoon, and you usually don't eat soup with a fork. Someone says, Jason, what are you talking about? I mean, we understand authority. We understand using things correctly in everyday life. Think about football or basketball or the rules of Frisbee. Understanding that you're eating Irish stew versus pizza. Um, the, idea, the idea of uh, TVs and the channels on a TV, a remote control. Someone may say, um, pack to, the, to their wife, pack the black suit. Well, that means not the gray suit. It means the black suit. Can I borrow your truck? Well, that simply means you would have one, and they understand that they can or cannot borrow it. Turn on the porch lights as opposed to the light in the bathroom. Telephone numbers, scores in games, a book I'm reading versus a book I'm not reading, a certain page number on that book that I'm reading, fan speeds. You know those big box fans have speeds one, two, and three, by the way, and they're not the different. They're, not, they're, they're different. One's louder than the other, depending on how you like to sleep. If you use one of those at night, maybe on, for sound. Oven settings. If you can turn one on, which I sometimes can't. Gears on a tractor. I know Brother McDonald understands. You're, you're, you go to put that thing at high speed, and you're just in the first gear. It's going to do a lot of jumping because it's meant to go in a certain direction to get there. What about batteries? You ever jumped off a car, and, and, you, put, and you were to hook the positive to the negative as opposed to the positive to the positive and the negative to the negative? What are you talking about, Jason? I'm simply saying we understand the idea of pattern or an, an authority. How many passwords do you have for your various websites or maybe your alarm code? When you go to get something to drink, do you know the difference between tea and water? If someone says, hey, text me a picture of so-and-so, well, do you know if they texted you the right picture of the right person? Just on and on I could go. Um, I have one right here. Did you feed the pigs? We're out of pig food. Believe me, don't ever buy pigs. We own four. What am I talking about? I, I'm simply saying this is not a hard sermon. It's basic, but yet the world seems to think it's hard. I want to talk about the critical importance of understanding Bible authority, and I'll look at it in three ways. As seen in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and as in a little bit of practical application today. And I, I need to hasten on. Number one, as seen in the Old Testament, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. Brother Terrence mentioned this in Bible class. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 15. Genesis 2 and 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded that man, uh, of the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. This is pure positive law. If you looked in your New Testament at Romans 5 and verse 14, it talks about those who sin not after the similitude or likeness of Adam's transgression, 
They're also going to be lost even under the old law. But what was Adam's transgression? I believe what you have here in Genesis chapter 2, and then of course they took up this tree, chapter 3, they're condemned, they're kicked out of the garden. We know the punishment on the man and the woman. He had to work and provide, and she would have pain in childbearing. There's punishment because of that particular sin. They began the physical dying process. They were spiritually separated in spiritual death at the moment they partook of that. And God, of course, had to work a way back for them to uh, be right with Him. He would do that, of course. You have those coats of animal skins, but ultimately to the cross of Jesus. Someone said when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, God headed toward Pentecost. That's exactly what happened. But here's my point. Pure positive law. Why could they not eat of this tree? Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. I want you to understand this, my friends. This is very important to our topic. It's critically important to understand Bible authority. Why could they not eat of this tree? Romans chapter 5 and verse number 14, the similitude of Adam's transgression. I'll tell you why. They could not eat of this tree for one reason. Don't miss this. Because God said don't eat of it. That's what you need to understand. The Bible is not hard to understand. God gave commandment and they were to do what God said do because God is God and they are not God. I could have gone back to Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning of verse 1, God created. And then verse 26, and it says that he created male and female. Uh, and then he goes on and says male and female, cre or, male and female created he them. Here's the point. He's the creator and we are not. And so the creator has the right to command. Notice Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, you have Cain and Abel, the two brothers. And of course, we know that Cain kills Abel. He is referred to as being evil in 1 John 3 and verse 12. You can read about that a little bit later. But here in Genesis chapter 4, particularly in verse number 3, the Bible says of Cain and Abel, And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his, his offering, but into Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Verse 7 uses the word accepted as opposed to, of course, not accepted. Now, the, Old, the New Testament gives commentary on this. We're going to go to Hebrews 11, but don't, don't leave Genesis. We're coming right back, but we're going to go to Hebrews 11 several times. But notice Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. It comments on this deal, this situation with Abel and Cain. Hebrews 11, 4. By faith, Abel offered. Now, I know from Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, then I know, verse 4, whatever was involved here, whether it had to be just an animal or whether he did it in an appropriate way by giving his first, the point is this, Abel did it according to what God said to do. I know that's the case. Hebrews 11, verse 4, For Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. My friends, that's Bible authority. Now, I want you to notice this before we pass on. Cain and Abel both had the right who, but one had the, the wrong how. Let that sink in. I heard old preachers say that years ago. Both had the right who. Both worshiped God, but one didn't do it the right way. He didn't do it according to Bible authority. He had the wrong how. And as a result, his works were not acceptable. Genesis chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 11. Well, if you were to go a little bit further and go to Genesis chapter 12, notice Ab Abraham here. We're talking about the patriarchal dispensation. You have the law of the patriarchs, the law of Moses, and the law of Christ. Under this point of Bible authority as seen in the Old Testament, particularly now with the patriarchs. You have in chapter 12, verse 4 for lack of time, Abraham, Abram, before he was called Abraham, departed. Why did he depart? Go back to verse 1 of chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy uh, kindred, and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Great nation, the seed promise, verse 3. Christ would come through him. That's what that means, verse 4. So Abraham departed, notice this phrase, as the Lord had spoken unto him. Now, if we were to go back prior to Abraham, I, I, I'm going to skip Genesis 22, where there God tells him to offer 
Isaac on the altar. And if we were to go there, you would notice that he was told to offer him. He took the wood. He put it in order. A lot's going on in Genesis 22. But I just want to go to Genesis chapter 6. I accidentally skipped this one. I don't know how I could skip this one. Genesis chapter 6, you have Noah and the ark. This is not the ark of the covenant that you see in the book of Exodus. This is, of course, that big boat that God told Noah to make to save him and his family from those who, of course, didn't want to follow God. Genesis chapter 6, everyone was committing sin and wickedness. Verse 5, that is, except for Noah and his family, weren't living that way. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, Noah was a just man. He walked with God. Go to verse number 11. The earth also was corrupt. Verse 12, God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt. Go down to verse 14. Genesis 6, 14. This is important. What does God tell Noah? God says to Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make it in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion of which you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. If you study all that out, a cubit was from the elbow to the tip of the, of the longest finger. is 18 to 21 inches. So if you were to even take the conservative measurement, this boat is a football and a field half, football and a field, uh, football, one football field and a half of another long, let's say it that way. And of course, it's, it's wider than a basketball court. It's, it's, it's nearly a 50 feet tall, about 45, I believe it is. This is a huge, huge boat. They built a, they built a model of it up in Kentucky. And let me tell you something, it is big, big. And so you have here this pattern. We're not going to read all of this. If you go down to verse 22, it kind of sums it up. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Chapter 7, verse 1, he and his family came into the ark. I don't think you should miss chapter 7 and verse 5 because it says the same thing as 6 and 22. God repeating something means I may ought to pay attention. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord God commanded him. Look at verse 9. They went in two and two unto Noah in the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. Similar language throughout this particular account. So we have this idea of a pattern concept. Now go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and we'll pick up discussions of Abraham and Noah in Hebrews 11. This is not a coincidence that God draws from all these Old Testament stories, connects it with what faith truly is in Hebrews chapter 11. We know faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17 again. We've looked at Hebrews 11, 4. Abel does what he does according to the Word of God. Look at verse number, uh, let's just go to Abraham verse since I covered them that way. Verse number 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out, that's Genesis 12, into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, circle this word in your King James, obeyed. Obeyed. And he went out. Now, if you were to go this section I skipped on, on Isaac, you could go to verse 17, and this is corresponding to Genesis 22. When he were, was about ready to slay Isaac with that knife, God stopped him. He, he realized God would just raise him from the dead, verse 17. But go back to Gen Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, this is Genesis 6, Moved with fear and prepared an ark. How did he do it? By faith. What does that mean? That means according to the specifications of authority. According to the word of God, Romans 10, 17. To the saving of his house by which he condemned the world. In what way does Noah condemn the world? Because the world should have done what Noah did. They should have obeyed God. That's how he condemned the world. They, he, he stands as a testimony that the world could have done what he and his family did. And of course, it says here that he's the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. We could go through all of these examples, but I want to look at a few other ones by looking at the law of Moses particularly. Turn, if you will, I'll tell you what, turn to the book of Exodus. Genesis, Exodus. I have to kind of lay a background here and then preach for a few minutes. Look at, look at Exodus chapter 20. I'm not going to really... You can kind of drive by 20. That's the Ten Commandments. Of course, there were 613 commandments with 10, of course, being the most famous that would uh, point to all these others that had to be kept as well. But you see all of these listed in Exodus 20. But then when you get to Exodus 25, I want you to notice here, here's the specifications given for the uh, tabernacle and all the furniture in the tabernacle. This is, this is Exodus 25. 
And in Exodus 25, verse number 9, what does Moses say about this situation? Exodus 25 and 9. By the way, this is quoted in the book of Hebrews. Just like Hebrews 11 quotes Genesis 3 and Genesis, or Genesis 4 rather, and Genesis 6 and Genesis 12 and Genesis 22. Here in Exodus 25 and verse 9, you have again this idea of the tabernacle, which will also be quoted in a different place in Hebrews, 8 and 5, by the way. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, that's a key word, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. He then gives all these different specifications of this furniture. Go down to verse number 40 of this same chapter, Exodus 25. And look that thou make them, all this furniture in the tabernacle, including the tabernacle itself, after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. That's Mount Sinai. So you see this same concept, not only in the law of the patriarchs, but also in the law of Moses. We could go to many, many places. We could go to so many places in, in numbers, but I just want to go straight to Leviticus. We've been in Genesis. We've been in Exodus. Let's just go to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 1, we could just start there. Leviticus chapter 1, we've already seen the tabernacle has a pattern in Exodus 25. And the Lord God called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. It is an offering of burnt sacrifice of the herd. Let him offer a male without blemish. Just wait a minute. What are we reading? He's giving specifications of what he wants. He says, take it of this particular type of animal. It needs to be a male as opposed to a female, etc., etc. He then in verse 9 says, In his inwards and his legs shall he wash with water. He gives specifications. Look at verse 11. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward. There's more specification. If that doesn't matter, why does he say it? Go over to Leviticus chapter 10. Let's just kind of, let's just really nail it down. Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10. There, of course, we're now we're talking about the law of Moses, under the law of Moses. Leviticus 10, verse 1 beginning. The critical importance of understanding Bible authority, seen in the law of the patriarchs, seen in the law of Moses. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire. Some versions say unauthorized fire before the Lord. Now this last sentence in verse 1 is exceedingly important which he commanded them not. What does that mean? Well, it means God had said how he wanted it done, what fire he wanted, what incense he wanted, and they went and got it from a different source. They got unauthorized, strange fire, and they said this is as good as any other. They used incense and so forth, and they did it not according to the pattern is the point, not according to God's authority. And what happens, verse 2, and God said, well, it doesn't really matter. A pattern is not that big of a deal. That is not what verse 2 says. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Verse 3, very important. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Verse 10, that you may put difference between holy and unholy. If you keep going on down and read the whole thing, basically uh, God tells their own daddy, don't you even cry for these boys because they have not followed the pattern of which they were given. You can go back and study in the book of Exodus and there was a pattern to the incense and to the offering of the incense and again to the source of the fire. We could go throughout many places in the Old Testament, but I want to show you just a few more under the old law. Turn, if you will, to um, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Have you ever heard about a man by the name of Uzzah? Young people, have you ever heard about Uzzah? Hopefully you have. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. They're going to bring, bring the ark. This is not Noah's boat. This is the ark of the covenant. Now that chest type object of which had a pattern, Exodus 25. It's not where it ought to be. They're going to go get it, verse 2, and bring up from thence the ark of God. Verse 3, here's a problem now. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. 
Now hold your hand here and go back to the book of Exodus. Remember where I talked about that pattern, chapter 25. Look at Exodus chapter 25, and I want you to go to Exodus 25. Now hold your hand in, in 2 Samuel and go to Exodus 25. I don't know how you do that if you have an iPhone. That's why you ought to have one in real Bible. Exodus chapter 25. And notice verse number 9. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so shall make it. Notice verse 10 begins the pattern of the ark of the covenant. And they shall make an ark of shot and wood, two cubits, and so forth and so on. But if you go all the way down to verse 12 of Exodus 25, And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be on the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves, that sticks, of shadow wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves in the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. That's how they were to carry the ark of the covenant. Well, now, wait a minute. If I'm over here in 2 Samuel 6, in verse 3, it says, They set the ark of God upon a new cart. They are not following the pattern of Exodus chapter 25 in the way that they are transporting this ark. In 2 Samuel 6 and verse number 3, continuing, 2 Samuel 6 and 3, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, and, and it goes on down, look at verse 6. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. I don't believe this is mischievous or of a bad attitude if you read the context. For Notice, for the oxen shook it. This thing was shifting and about to maybe fall off of this wagon. And Uzzah just naturally reaches up and tries to steady it. And I want you to notice verse number 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 6. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Wow. Turn to Numbers chapter 4 in your Old Testament. Numbers chapter 4 and verse 15. If you were going to study it fully, you would study Exodus 25. You would study 2 Samuel 6. You would study Numbers chapter 4. Notice Numbers 4 and verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary, tabernacle, and all the vessels of the sanctuary, and we know there's a pattern in Exodus 25, as the camp is set forward, after that the sons of Kohath, against specificity to who was to carry it, shall come to bear it. Remember those staves, Exodus 25. Watch this, Numbers 4, 15. But they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. Now this in Numbers 4 was written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Uzzah did what he did in 2 Samuel chapter 6. God said, I'm telling you, do not touch the Ark of the Covenant. Hundreds of years later, Uzzah, I believe with good intention, reaches up and touches the Ark and boom, God struck him dead. Just like in Leviticus chapter 10. Just like in Genesis chapter 2, don't you eat of this tree. Cain, Abel, you worship a certain way. Cain didn't do it authorized, Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham, get out of this country. Abraham said, yes, I'm going. Abraham, sacrifice your son Isaac. He says, okay, no problem. And, I, and Abraham, being a man of faith, said, God will just raise him up because he already told me he's the seed of promise. These illustrations are all throughout the Bible. Just let's just keep with this same one. Go to 1 Chronicles. I love the language here in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 regarding Uzzah. 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, same context, verse 3, and let us bring again the ark. Now I find it interesting in verse 4 that all the people thought it was a right thing to do and I guess they also thought it was a right thing to do to put it on this new cart, verse 7. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart. And Uzzah and Ahau drave the cart. I mean, First Chronicles 13, 8. This is also interesting. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might. You know what that is? That's sincerity. They were giving their all to God. I think about people today that worship God with all of their might and all of their heart. But the question is, is it according to the full pattern? Attitude, by the way, is part of the pattern, but it's not the only thing in the pattern. Verse number 9. 
And when they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark. Remember Numbers 4.15. And there he died before before God. Verse 12 is interesting, and David was afraid of God. Well, I guess he should have been. But he actually should have been before he put it on the cart. Notice 1 Chronicles 15. It gives more commentary on this situation. (laughs) So now he's going to bring the ark of God. Months had passed. And he says, we need to to fix this thing. But I want you to notice the attitude difference in chapter 15, verse 2. Then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. You know what? Can I just say it this way? I'm, I'm going to use some figurative language so don't pass out. David been to church. David went to church and understood what the book said, and he said, we better get back to the book, and we better carry the ark of God according to the way God said the ark ought to be carried. And as a result, guess what? Some good things are going to happen. Jason, where are you getting all this? Verse number 13, for because ye did it not at the first, the Lord God uh, made a breach upon us, watch this, for that we sought him not after the due order. Not after the pattern, not according to the authority. That's what he's simply saying here in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Do we have time to go to 1 Kings chapter 12 where Jeroboam set up worship at Dan, one altar at Dan and one altar altar at Bethel. I've actually been to Dan. It's it's an incredible uh, picture there. I'm sitting there at Dan taking a a selfie by the old archives of where he built this uh, particular idol. It's a crazy memory in my head some years ago. But the point is he was changing worship from Jerusalem to Dan and Bethel. King Jeroboam, 1 Kings chapter 12. If you read that whole chapter, you know what it said? It says this thing became a sin unto him. These answers and these illustrations are all throughout the Bible. Look at 1 Samuel 13. Just one more, we'll go to the New Testament. 1 Samuel 13, uh, probably not one more. I'll, I'll give a few in passing, but I mean turning there. 1 Samuel chapter 13 Here we find that Saul, the Philistines, are about to engage in battle. Samuel, the man of God, was not yet come to offer the sacrifice. 1 Samuel 13, look at verse 7, the last phrase. And all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days. He's waiting on Samuel. According to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal. So Saul's like, we got a problem. we got to make this sacrifice because the Philistines may kill us. What are we going to do? Verse number 9, or verse number 8 rather, or yet 9. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me. This is the king, not Samuel. This is Saul. Peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. That's not authorized. Verse 10, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, the preacher says basically, this man who could offer the sacrifice, the prophet, Samuel says, 1 Samuel 13, 11, what hast thou done? Look down to verse 12, the last sentence. What does Saul say? I forced myself. Therefore, an offer to burn offering. In other words, I, it had to be done, so I just, I just did it. I, I, you know, I thought it was a good thing. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. Verse 14, he then rips the kingdom from him. I don't have time to go to chapter 15. He said, Utterly destroy the, the Amalekites. He only destroyed part of the Amalekites. And if you go to that particular chapter in chapter 15, you're going to find God says that disobedience is as rebellion and as the sin of witchcraft. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Again, I don't have time to go to 1 Kings 18. The prophets of Elijah there were the prophets of Baal. They were doing what's unauthorized. He was doing what was authorized. What did he say to them? He said, How long halt you between two opinions? Micaiah in 1 Kings 22 is a good illustration. Of this. Amos chapter 7, the plumb line of Amos, which by the way is a pattern if you will. He was measuring the children of Israel. The point I'm trying to make my friends and brethren is this. When you study the Old Testament, Romans 15, 4, which is written for our learning, you're going to find that we have to follow the pattern of God and do that which is authorized or else we're not following God's word correctly. Jason, where are you getting this? <laughs> I just showed you, but, but what about Jeremiah 
Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, it's not a man that walks to direct his own steps. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right unto a, a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Psalm 119, 104, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What about Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 20, to the law and to the testimony, if any man speak not according to this word, there is no light in him. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 20, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. It puts Sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. Light for darkness and darkness for light. My friends, the problem today is we live in a world where people do not read their Old Testament. They don't study their Old Testament. And yet my Bible says and will ever say what Joshua, or what Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Friends, we have to make sure that we love people enough to tell them the truth. We have to tell people what the Bible says. And the Bible says, follow the Bible. Daniel chapter 3, they came to those three friends of Daniel and they said, you got to bow down to this image. I love what it says there in Daniel chapter 3. We refer to them oftentimes as their, their non-Jewish names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what did, what did they say? They said, whether the Lord will deliver us or whether the Lord will not deliver us, we will not bow. Why? Because God said you can't do that. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel, don't you know you'll be throwing the lion's den if you pray to any god other than, other than the king? Daniel says, go ahead and put me in there. I don't care. I'm not going to compromise or change what the truth teaches, even if I get eaten by lions. Yes, the Old Testament's very clear. We can go to Jeremiah 6, where it talks about the old paths. We can go to 1 Corinthians 10 in the New Testament, by the way, which quotes story after story, historical account, of the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and uses all of these, calls them examples, 1 Corinthians 10, about verse 6 and verse 11. And then in verse 12, he says in the New Testament, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand, referring to the Old Testament stories, take heed lest he fall. So we see it in the Old Testament, but what about the New Testament? Is it any different? So he says, well, that's the old law. We live under the new law. I understand the old law can't save us. I get that. No law can save us. We need Christ. But Christ also has a law. It's called the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. It's called the spirit of the life in Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8. It's called the perfect law. Uh, it's called the law of faith in the book of Romans. But just turn to Matthew chapter 7. I mean, this is the way, G this sounds like the Old Testament in the sense of obeying a pattern. In Matthew chapter 7, how many times have you heard this spoken? Preachers used to quote it all the time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will. Doesn't that, isn't that saying he that follows the authority? He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name? These are clearly religious people, by the way. And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonder, wonderful works. So they were not only religious, they were doing it in the name of Jesus. Verse 23. And Jesus says, And then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What do you mean you never knew them? Because, verse 21, they weren't truly doing the will of God. They just thought they were. And then verse 24 to 27, he talks about those that do the will of God versus those, verse 26, that doeth not. And it's connected with sayings, verse 24, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, verse 26, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. That's the context. What about Romans chapter 6? We're studying Romans in Bible class on Sunday morning. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 16 this refers to a pattern, and it refers to the pattern of the right attitude and the right doctrine. Romans 6, 16, Know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. Notice, obeyed and heart. That form of doctrine, there's teaching, which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Well, this is not the only time this is taught in Romans. If you go back to Romans chapter 2, and you were to look at verse number 4, after it talks about the goodness of God that leads to repentance, verse 5 then talks about those that don't obey God, Romans 2, 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath uh, of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render every man according to his deeds, verse 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. 
That sounds like a pattern to me. Jason, are you saying that we have to follow the authority of God, the pattern of the Bible in the New Testament, just as they had to in the Old Testament? I'm saying that's what the Bible teaches. Hebrews 5, 9, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Remember earlier when I kind of began to quote some of the Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony? There's a reason I'm doing that, because I'm going to do it right now with the New Testament. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 14, you're my friends if you do whatsoever things I command you. Luke 6, 46, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? 1 John 2 and 1 John 5, His commandments are not grievous. But those that obey Him are going to be accepted with Him. If you read 1 John 2 and 1 John 5, on and on we could go. The point is, the Old Testament was a pattern. They had to follow the pattern of the patriarchal dispensation, the law of Moses, and of course we have to follow it under the law of Christ. You don't believe me? Turn to 2 Timothy 1.13. I know you do. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, there's so many people, they just don't believe the Bible's a pattern. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 13. 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 13. Hold fast the form of sound words. You know what the original language is here? It's a horse, a horse whose foot makes an imprint in the dirt when it's running. And so it makes that imprint or that pattern in the dirt. Picture that in your mind. That's the language here in the original. And so he says, hold fast the form of the pattern, the authority, if you will, of sound words. If you go back to 1 Timothy 1.3, he left Timothy in Ephesus. Paul, why did you leave Timothy in Ephesus? He says he left him in Ephesus, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 3, the last phrase, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. How big a deal is this, Paul? 1 Timothy 1.10, the last phrase. And if there is anything contrary to sound doctrine. Chapter 4, verse 6, what's a good minister? One that brings them into the words of good doctrine, 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 6. How big a deal is doctrine, Paul? 1 Timothy 4 and 16. He says to Timothy, Timothy, take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine. Paul, how big a deal is doctrine as you write to Timothy? A few verses earlier, 1 Timothy 4, 13. Give yourself to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Doctrine is teaching, by the way. And then you have in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse, uh, verse number um, 2, that this doctrine is to be committed to faithful men who teach others also. They're to study to show themselves approved, 2, 15. And of course, that famous passage in 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. That for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itch, itching ears. I could go to many, many other passages. I think you get the point. Jason, what, what does this have? What, what, what is your point in all of this? We have to do what the Bible teaches and only what the Bible teaches. So when the Bible says there's one church and Jesus said, I will build my church, we need to be a part of that church. When the Bible says that we're to worship on the first day of the week, which we know that's what it says, 1 Corinthians 16, Acts chapter 20. Uh, we know that's the day that Jesus came forth from the grave. We know that's the day the church was built, Acts chapter 2. Guess what? We're to worship Him on the first day of the week. It doesn't mean you can't have a Bible study other days, but that's the pattern of New Testament worship. When God says that the husband is the head of the wife, that means the husband is the head of the wife. No, don't get, don't get bowed up now. I didn't say a man can treat a woman any way he wants to him acceptable to God. He has to love his wife like Christ loved the church. And let me tell you something, that's plenty hard. But the Bible still says the husband is the head of the wife. Some years ago, the Baptist Convention had a vote on whether or not the husband was still the head of the wife. And I think they finally concluded, well, I guess he is. You don't have to vote on what Paul, through inspiration, wrote thousands of years ago. The husband's ahead of the wife. The wife is to submit to the husband. The husband is to deeply, genuinely, sacrificially love his wife. The children are to obey their parents in the Lord. Why? The Bible says, for this is right. We need to understand the Bible is a pattern. Let me give you a little more New Testament. 1 Peter 4, 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And of course, also we have other passages to that effect, including Colossians 3, 17. 
Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone says, what do you mean do in the name of? Read Acts chapter 4. They, there, there, were, there were miracles. They healed in the first century. They healed a man that had been lame. And he said, by the name of Christ and according to his power have we done this. Power or authority. So we see that doing something in the name of means doing it by the authority of. We need to do that which is authorized and only authorized by Scripture. we got to kind of wrap this up pretty quick. So let me just give an example or two. You notice this morning we had congregational reciprocal singing. Why did we do that? Why did we not have a praise team up here? Why did we not have drums or a guitar or a piano? Why, why, why not have some of those things? Turn to John 16, 13. John 16 and verse number 13. John 16, 13. Here the Bible says, of course he's referring to the apostles. When you study the chain of authority, you'll realize Jesus said in Matthew 28, All authority has been given unto me. Who gave it to him? The Father. He came to earth, and of course on earth he was subservient and submissive to the Father. He said, I always do the things that please the Father. Well, then when he was going to go back to glory, in chapter 16, verse 7, he says, i got to go away, but if I go away, I'm going to send the Comforter. We know that's the Holy Spirit if you read John 14, 15, 16. But in John 16, 13, what was His Holy Spirit going to do? John 16, 13. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He, that's the Holy Spirit, will guide you, in context, that's the apostles, those that had been with Jesus. If you notice John 15, 27, it tells you that. They, they were those who had been with Him from the beginning. Go back to John 16, 13. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now notice, they wrote all this stuff down. John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. What's the context? Jesus praying. Who's he praying for? The apostles. But in verse 21, he also prays for you and I, everyone who would believe on him through their word. John 17, 21, that they all may be one, that's unity, not union, but unity, true unity, as thou, Father, art in me, watch this, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Well, how is that going to happen? What's going to happen? He said, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, Sorry, verse 20 is how it's going to happen. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jason, what's your point? Here's my point. If they were guided into all truth, John 16, 13, and they were. If they wrote it down, and it's truth, John 17, 17, John 17, 20, and they did, then when we do what the Bible teaches... We're going to be following the Bible the way we're supposed to follow the Bible. If we add to or if we take away, that's a problem. Really? Does it say that in the Old Testament? Deuteronomy chapter 4, first part of the Old Testament says, don't you add to and don't you take away. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 6, don't, don't add to, imply it also, don't take away. And at the very end of the Bible in the New Testament, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, don't add to and don't take away. Jason, are you simply saying we should do what the Bible teaches and not add to and not take away? No, I'm saying that's what God says. God says in the patriarchal dispensation, do what I say because I said to do it. In the law of Moses, do what I say because I said to do it. In the new covenant, do what I say because I said to do it. Don't add to, don't take away. Where? Beginning of the Bible, middle of the Bible, end of the Bible. So here's my question. If you were to read the New Testament, and that's the covenant we're under according to the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews and the book of Colossians, what did they do? Well, I know this much. They had congregational reciprocal singing, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Colossians 3 and verse 17, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. The other passage says, teaching one another in these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Guess what we were doing this morning? We were speaking to each other, we were teaching to each other, and we were doing exactly what the Bible authorizes. Someone says, Jason, why do you do what you do when it comes to New Testament congregational singing? Because all of the verses in the New Testament have been read. I'll just use Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 7, 16 as an example, and they give authorization to do exactly what we did. You see, there's no more authority to have a solo or a choir as they have, to have a piano or a banjo. There's not authority to get up here and make, make fake sounds with your, with your uh, mouth because that's not teaching. And the teaching needs to be something that is biblical, of course. So the point I'm trying to simply make is we understand this. Let me give you an illustration. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. Someone says, what about the songbook? 
Or sometimes you see a man get up here with a pitch pipe and it makes a sound and, and, then, and then he leads the song. What about that? Think back to, think back to the, to the uh, Genesis 6 and, and the, ark, the Noah's Ark. There were specific commands and there were general commands. Specific commands, build an ark. Specific commands, it had to have a plurality of rooms. Specific command, use pitch within and without. Specific command, it must be made of gopher wood. Specific command, according to all that God commanded him, there was a pattern. Specific command, that is, it would save those who were in the ark. What's specific? It had three levels. What's specific? One door, where? On the side. Those are specifics. But what about generics? Well, it doesn't say what tools he could use. It just says build it of gopher wood. He could use hammers, he could use saws. In fact, it doesn't specify it doesn't specify where to get the gopher wood from. It could be grove of trees, clump A, clump B, clump C, down the hill, up the mountain, whatever. He just said it better be a gopher wood. And so you have generic commands and specific commands. What about uh, the idea of um, a measuring method? Now, it tells you how many cubits, but it doesn't say you could use a stick or some kind of ruler or whatever. The living quarters, it doesn't tell you what level the living quarters were on, so I guess they had discretion in that. Also, what about the connectors that made the different levels? He doesn't specify on that. Which side? He just says the side of the ark that he put the door. So you see there are, generic, there are specific commands and there are generic commands. And think about the tools for a minute. He used, let's say, a hammer as the idea of an aid to build the ark of gopher wood. So, I, so what if he would have used a different kind of wood? I don't know what gopher wood was, but let's just say it wasn't oak. If he had used oak, he would have been adding a different type of wood because it wasn't gopher. But he could use a hammer because that was simply an aid to help him carry out what God had commanded. That songbook is simply an aid to help carry out congregational reciprocal singing that involves teaching and admonishing one another. And so a songbook is in no way an addition. It is simply an aid. But a piano is a whole different type of music. There are only two musics in all the, all the world. There is vocal and there is mechanical instrumental. And notice, God doesn't even just authorize vocal. He authorizes even more specific. He authorizes singing, not just vocal. So if a man gets up here, that's the same thing as a piano. It's unauthorized. What I'm simply saying, unless you, you, know, you think I've lost my mind, if it mattered in the Old Testament, it mattered in Genesis 2, it mattered in Genesis 4, it mattered in Genesis 12, it mattered in Genesis 22, it mattered in Leviticus chapter 10, it mattered in 1 Samuel 13 and 1 Samuel 15 and 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 1 Chronicles 13 and 1 Chronicles 15 and on and on we could go. And it certainly matters in the New Testament. If you love me, keep my commandments. I don't have time because I have to close the sermon, but I've written here in my notes, the Bible authorizes explicitly and implicitly, that which is stated in so many words and that which naturally follows. You could use this as an example of Genesis 13. It says that Abram went down into Egypt. Later it says that he came up out of Egypt and Lot was with him. But the Bible never explicitly says Lot went down into Egypt. But it does say he came out of Egypt. You can't go into some, or can't come out of a place you didn't go into. So I know through implication he went down or else he couldn't have come up. We've got to learn how to think, brethren. People used to think. You know why the church was growing by droves in the 1800s? Because people could think. And they could use their minds. And they said, you know what? We better do what the Bible says, all of what the Bible says. I could discuss temporary versus permanent. Miracles were temporary. The Word of God is permanent. We could talk about all these things. Optional versus obligatory. We're not obligated to meet two times on the Lord's Day. It's optional. We are obligated to meet one time on the Lord's Day. And then the elders can have a second service if they so will. According to Hebrews 13 verse 7, in order to feed the flock, Acts chapter 20. People sometimes have a, have a hard time thinking through plain language and figurative language. Let me just give you an example. Acts chapter 8, I believe it's about verse 30. I may have the wrong verse. Philip was told to, to run to the chariot. Philip and the eunuch. And the Bible says he ran thither to the chariot. Question, are we commanded to run? Right now, do I got to take off running as I'm preaching? No. Why? Because we know from that context that his running was simply, a, number one, a miraculous situation. He was told to do by, by, by the Spirit of God, an angel. But secondly, it's incidental what he was doing. It's just like in Acts chapter 20. If you read Acts chapter 20... There were many lights. 
And they were in an upper room. So why are we not today in an upper room? We do have many lots, but why are we not in an upper room? Are we doing that which is unauthorized? No, because those things were incidental. But the Lord's Supper had been commanded to be taken, 1 Corinthians 11, Matthew chapter 26, elsewhere. And Acts 20 is a perfect example of how they did it. But the lights are irrelevant and incidental if you actually read the context of the thing. Just like that hammer versus a saw was an aid, not an addition. I want to simply say, my friends and brethren, we can know what the Bible teaches and we can do what the Bible says and we can use our minds. Matthew, Matthew, uh, rather, uh, Mark chapter 7 and verse 13. I love this verse. Jesus condemned the Pharisees and Sadducees for, for teaching traditions of men and washing of hands, which were not taught in the Old Testament as a command. And in Mark 7, 13, he said, and many other like such things they do. That means implication. We can understand they did other things. Galatians 5 and verse 20. After condemning all the works of the flesh, he says, and the such like. Wait a minute. Paul, you're telling me that God expects me to use my mind, Galatians 5, 19 and 20, and understand what and such like means? The implication otherwise is that God wasted his time telling us something. When I, I, I have brethren today, well, you can't really know what modesty is. Then why did he command us to be modest if you can't know what it is? Well, we really can't understand what worship is. Then why did he say worship in spirit and in truth? No, the problem is people don't know the book. And as a result, what happens is they go to the left and they go to the right and they're confused. And they don't know this from that or the other. We don't want to be any of that. We don't want to bind where God is not bound. We don't want to loose where God is not loose. Read the book of Proverbs 17 and 15, I believe it is. He said both are an abomination unto God. Here's what I want to do, 2 John verse 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Brother Paul, that's serious. He that abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth, that means stays in it, abides in the doctrine of Christ, the teaching of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. People come around and say, well, it doesn't say not to have a pen. Let's go to our scripture reading and let's, let's kind of land this plane, if you will. 2 Samuel chapter 7. <clears throat> this is maybe not as popular as some of the other verses, but I think this gets the job done. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 7. This is dealing with David wanting to build the temple versus the tabernacle. And if, if you look at, he, he says this, David wants to build it. If you read the whole context in other places, it basically said, well, look at verse number 2. The king said unto Nathan the prophet, I'm in 2 Samuel 7, 2. I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within courage. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. That's not true. Verse 3, Nathan did not inquire of God. That was Nathan's opinion. He was a good man, by the way. He was, a, he was the one that rebuked David. He said, oh, yeah, that sounds good, David. Go build you a temple. God says, hold up. I didn't tell you to build a temple. Look at verse number 7. God says, in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, circle it, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people of Israel, saying, why build ye not me in house of cedar? That phrase, spake I a word. In other words, remember Leviticus chapter 20, they offered strange fire which God commanded them not. Let me give you New Testament. Hebrews 7, 8, uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14 and 8, 4. Hebrews 7, 4, put this in your notes. Hebrews 7, 14 and 8, 4. It tells us there that Jesus on earth could not have been a priest. Why? He wasn't from Levi. He was from Judah. Hebrews 7.14, Hebrews 8.4. And you know what it says there in one of those two passages? It says, because God spake nothing. That's the same thing as spake our word. That's the same thing as Leviticus 10, which I commanded them not. In other words, silence. God's silence does not authorize. God's silence forbids Implication binds, silence forbids. I can prove it before I offer the invitation. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I've used this here with you guys before. But God specifies unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. Even some of our good religious friends who aren't thinking through this stuff properly know, know, know what I'm about to say. 
If I were to say to them, can you use pepperoni pizza and Sprite on the Lord's table instead of unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, grape juice, if you will? They would say, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. You can't use Domino's pepperoni pizza. By the way, Domino's is specific versus just pizza. That, that's another lesson. You can't use pepperoni pizza and Sprite. They, they would say, I mean, most religious people would say, no, no, you can't do that. Of which I would say, why not? And they would say, because God, I'd say, keep coming. Because God has specified, keep coming. Because God has specified what he wants. Amen. That's right. And if we do what God says to do, we'll be what God's people were then. We'll be pure New Testament Christians. Don't add to, don't take away. A man asked me the other day, what are you religiously? I said, I am a New Testament Christian, a member of the Church of Christ. He begins to talk about the 500 AD and the Reformation movement, the Catholic Church, the Reformation movement. I said, no, 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 way before all of that, AD 30, AD 33, depending on your time scale. I'm talking about New Testament Christianity, no denominations, no doctrines of men, no creeds of men. This is how they preached in the 1800s. They would simply say, get rid of your denominational names, get rid of, get, get rid of your creed books. Let us follow the Bible and only the Bible and all the Bible. Let us speak where the Bible speaks. Be silent where the Bible is silent. I've spent many hours lately studying restoration history in this country in the 1800s. Someone says, why do you study it? I'll tell you why. Because there was a time in this country when people got in the book, preached the book, all of the book and only the book, and they were being converted by the thousands and thousands and thousands. You know why we're not converting people today? Because we aren't preaching the Bible anymore. We're preaching opinion, and we're preaching things. We don't hurt anybody's feelings. Someone may learn here to leave here today and get mad at me. I don't want you mad at me, but I'm going to tell you something. You better make sure God isn't mad at you. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. There are different styles. T.B. Laramore reminds me of John Hall. He was a gentleman preacher and wonderful. Converted thousands. So did Marshall Keeble. He was plain. So did J.D. Tant. Different styles, one gospel. Let us never depart from the truth. Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks to God the Father through Him. Can I say this? If you're not a Christian, here's how you become one. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16.16. 16. The Catholics say you should be sprinkled when you're a baby. So your 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 law your 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 you you you're baptized and then later when you grow up you're believed because they sprinkle babies. The Protestants say you say you're saved when you believe. By that I mean Baptists, etc. And I love these people. I do. They're a lot of my friends. They say you're saved when you believe, and then later you ought to be baptized. But Jesus Jesus said it so plain. He that believeth and there's a conjunction is baptized shall be saved. Why not just do that, become a Christian? Be added to the church, Acts chapter 2. Not go to the left, not go to the right, and just go to heaven. What's wrong with that? I'll quote my granddaughter as I leave this uh, lesson. She understands authority. I'm Pops and BJ's B. And I'll say to Rowan, I'll say, Rowan, do you love Pops or B? She'll say, B. Someone said, well, she just says that because B was last. I said, okay. Rowan, do you love B or Pops? She said, B. I said, Rowan, do you love B or B? She said, B. I said, Rowan, do you love Pops or Pops? She said, B. <laughs> she understands authority. Little children, we understand it. Guys, listen, I know I get excited when I preach. I love you. I love people. But I know this much. John 12, 48 is true. He that rejecteth me, Jesus said, and hath not... The, hath the words which I've spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. Listen, it's going to judge the world. We better make it plain so that people can run it as they read or read as they run, run according to the Old Testament prophet. Won't you come if you have a need as we stand and we sing?